Um, uh, one second. Okay, um, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, actually, before we get started, I should just remind you all to select the language you want to hear from the interpretation menu, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the conversation today is taking place in English, but it is being simultaneously translated into Portuguese. So make sure that you select the right channel um, using the interpretation button. I will try and speak a bit more slowly than I normally would <laughs> in order to make that a bit easier. So please just bear with me. Um, so this is the third conversation taking place in this series, Decolonization in the 2020s, um, which has been organized between After All, which is a research and publishing organization based at Central Saint Martin, uh, the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, MASPE, uh, Goldsmiths Department of Visual Cultures and UAL's Decolonizing Arts Institute. Um, to very briefly introduce myself, my name is Amber Hussein. I'm a managing editor at After All. Um, we publish a journal, a number of book series, and a range of online projects. Um, and we're extremely lucky to be joined this evening by Margarita Waco and Diego del Valle Rios. Uh, Diego and Margarita will be in conversation for 30, 40 minutes, um, after which we will start looking at questions from the audience. So please do post these in the Q&A box as we go. The Q it's maybe easier um, to use the Q&A box rather than the chat just to keep everything in one place if possible, but the chat is also fine. Um, so to introduce our speakers, <clears throat> I'll start with Margarida. Um, originally hailing from Angola, Margarida Waco uh, has a master's in architecture from the Royal Danish Academy, KDK, uh, and the Aarhus School of Architecture. Um, her work lies at the intersection of architecture, research, publishing, and curating. She heads up strategic outreach for the Funambulist, uh, which is a publication which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about a lot in the next hour. Uh, it's a magazine dedicated to the politics of space and bodies. Uh, she's also an assistant researcher at KADK, uh, the Royal Danish Academy. Uh, now, Diego. Diego de Valerios is an editor, cultural manager, facilitator, and an independent writer. Uh, since 2017, he's been editor-in-chief of Terremoto magazine, uh, a platform dedicated to the dissemination of critical thinking around contemporary art in the continent known as America. Uh, having previously lived in Guadalajara, he has worked at Arena, please excuse my pronunciation, Arena Mexico Arte Contemporaneo, uh, in Tale Mexicano de Gobelinos, uh, Paramo Galeria, and the Diaresis Collection. Uh, he's part of the independent study group uh, Circulo Permanente de Estudios Independientes, Menos Foucault, Mas Shakira. Um, and he recently participated in the editorial project Crónicas de Sangre en Pura, uh, co-edited with Andrea Pacheco uh, through Felipe Manuela in Madrid. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to get the conversation going. Um, Obviously, we're talking about publishing today. Um, Diego and Margarita have both contributed a short essay to this event series, giving their thoughts on sort of the key challenges and possibilities they see for publishing um, and attempts at decolonization within the publishing sphere for the coming decade. Uh, so those will be published after the discussion on afterallartschool.org after all in English and on the Maspe website in Portuguese. Um, so I thought to start things off, uh, I will hand over to the two of you, either one of you can go first, <laughs> to talk, maybe, I, okay, Diego, why, you, why don't you talk first about your, oh, just introduce briefly your work at Terremoto. Um, and what kind of coloniality, decoloniality, and post-coloniality mean to you, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you to, for, to you and Amanda for inviting me to this uh, series of talks and essays. Uh, first of all, I want to thank to all the people that are being uh, following these themes and, and unfolding research reflections 
through the academy and through own experiences in the margins that makes this uh, well this conversation possible. Well, as uh, as I was introduced, I'm Diego del Valle Rios. I'm the editor in chief since 2017 of Terremoto Magazine. The magazine is based in Mexico City, and it was founded in 2013 uh, by Dorothée Dupuy, a French curator uh, who moved to Mexico City seven years ago. And well, uh, what, what we've been doing, Terremoto started as a blog in 2013, and two years from that, uh, we started, we started uh, generating original content, editorial content, first uh, through the editorial uh, guidance of Natalia Valencia, uh, a Colombian curator. And well, as I, as I mentioned, I joined in, in 2017 after Natalia stepped out. Um, in those terms, well, as we can see, or as, as we can uh, uh, understand, Terremoto was founded by, by white women, uh, white migrant women uh, in, in the context of Mexico City. Uh, Mexico City being uh, the center of, of the nation state that we know as, as Mexico, which is important to acknowledge that is occupying the indigenous land of several indigenous nations uh, throughout the territory. Uh, from there on, with all these layers, being myself also a person uh, that benefits from heterosexuality and whiteness, uh, as an editor, I've been putting, I've been looking or trying to treason that pact that allies me to the to the racist uh, order that that we live in this country. There on the editorial activities that I've been doing in terms of decoloniality. Uh, or anti-colonial practices is a uh, searching of how to redistribute the power that comes with the position of an editor, and they're on the uh, in and they're on the position of an editor in a magazine that is positioned as as it's our slogan says contemporary in the Americas. So they're on uh, it's aligning to an understanding of the. Uh, Organization de Estados Americanos, American State Organization, uh, of how it reads this part of the world. Uh, and it's, it's again aligned to a north south dichotomy, it's, it's aligned to an understanding of the world through a geopolitics that still erases stories, experiences, and knowledge that does not enter into the Western centered epistemologies. So they're on. Uh, Terremoto has been trying from, from, from there to redistribute that power, uh, questioning what does it mean to decide who is writing about what subjects in the context, in the several contexts that we live in, with the mission of also articulating a, re a region that is uh, a, a global south, we, we can say, that considers not only the south idea of the continent, uh, but also considers all those marginalized or historically oppressed communities in Canada or the U.S. Uh, so what I've been doing basically is an, uh, a way of equilibrating or, or fracturing all those uh, canons uh, through the contamination, we can say, of all those bodies that are uncomfortable for, for, that, for the hegemony. Uh, they're on what I understand as decoloniality in this in this geography, specifically in this context. And I'm talking not only in, in terms of Mexico, but on the context of all uh, former Spanish colonies, is a process of rethinking ourselves in relation to power and a way of articulating the, the possibility of articulating politics of, of restoration, of paying and repairing. Uh, decolonization is a non-ending process, is, is a provocation to destabilize the world, to hesitate language, to bite our, our, our tongues and doubt of our own experiences, uh, considering or taking uh, as, as, uh, as a point of departure what philosopher and psychologist Sueli Rolnik calls the uh, colonial, the colonial, capitalist colonial uh, unconscious, in which our bodies are totally part of a, of, of a necropolitical system, 
in the case of Mexico or in Mexico City specifically, a system that not only exp exploits, explodes and kills every type of body from a natural body to, uh, to uh, female feminized or indigenous bodies, but also maintains a military uh, nucleus uh, around the narco war that we've been living for the last 20 years. They're on the position that I, that I choose to, to, to get to incarnate as, as an editor of a magazine is a position of someone that is uh, trying to burn out the factories of whiteness. Thank you very much, um, Diego. That was a great introduction. Um, there's obviously crossover, but you're working in very different contexts. Um, so Margarita, could you also tell us a bit about your work with the Fernambulist, your kind of reading of the project of decoloniality um, and any other ideas that you'd like to introduce before we start the conversation? Yes, um, allow me to just share my screen. Is, is that possible? Yeah, it should be. Um, can you... S uh, let me see here. Should be at the bottom, there's a green. All right. So you see my screen, my PDF? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Just a moment. And you still see it? Yeah. Good. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Amber, thank you very much for the very warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I'm very humbled and happy to be here and should be given the opportunity to delve into these questions with uh, both you and Diego. Um, so, uh, just a minute, yeah. So firstly, in a quest to call the agency of the publication into question in a time of, I would say, political, cultural and social upheaval, what for me proved to be vital was, to, was what I have attempted to formulate in the following two uh, statements. So firstly, how do we strive to curate alternative stories that extend the agency of the publication to the marginalized subject? And secondly, how do we lend this power to stories that allow us to understand the world through multiple voices, angles, and perspectives when curatorial practices, which is, which, which is really what we do when we, when we publish? Uh, abound, on, into, uh, abound to a sort of knowledge base that is defined by a Western gaze and sort of with all these implications that follow with this very particular way of viewing the world. Um, so in an attempt to provide a few yet inconclusive answers, um, I'll allow myself to delve into the politics of publishing as we carry out through our editorial practice at the Finambulist. Um, so basically the Finambulist is an editorial platform that exists through three complementary channels, a blog, a magazine and a podcast that was launched in the blog first in 2010 and then the blog podcast arrived in 2013 and then we finally launched the very first issue of the magazine which is published every every other month uh, since 2000, 2015. Um, and initially launched in 2010 the Funambulist has for the past 11 years articulated questions that relate to the political dimension of the relationship between bodies design and the built environment and as such, we are assembling an ongoing archive for anti-colonial, anti-racist, queer and feminist struggles. As of today, we have released, we have released uh, 34 uh, magazine issues where each issue has been dedicated to one particular topic that tends to mobilize different geographical contexts and various scales from architecture to clothing to food politics to labor and then latest our international issue that celebrates the 50, uh, 150 anniversary of the Paris Commune. This also means that we have collaborated with more than 400 extraordinary people that are located uh, around the world who have not only given to the Finambulist the quality of its editorial line but also informed it in such a way that have become paramount for advancing critical discussions. 
And the particularity of these contributors is that, or sorry, ever since we launched, we have dedicated to mobilize this international community of activists, practitioners and academics by providing this platform where these different voices could potentially meet and ultimately build international solidarity. Um, and these are some of the grounds that we have covered so far. Um, so, so many of the contributors are not directly related to the disciplines of architecture design, but rather to humanities or political activism, which really allows for crucial bridges to be construct, co constructed between the two worlds. So I will speak a bit about what we call the politics of contents of the publication. Publications are here to re relay, to produce, and to uh, curate knowledge. However, publishing is inherently political. It is an instrument of power. And furthermore, it's a contested terrain in which power is continuously negotiated and where most of the global population continues to be silenced. And from this posi positionality, how do we then lend this power to stories that allow us to understand the world through multiple voices, angles and perspectives, as I started asking in my, uh, in my introductory statement. And this will basically be address addressed as the politics of content. For decades, universities and cultural institutions have been operating in a way that consists in valuing knowledge produced through as a simulacrum of objective objectivity, which basically means that the more one is presumably remote from a given situation, the more the knowledge one produces about it is considered as valuable. On the contrary, and re revisiting our editorial practice, we operate through an inverse bias that embraces the subjectivity of situated knowledge. So in a quest to center incarnated knowledge, we are able to understand the world through the particular political situations of which we are addressing. And in turn, this is where the notion of use usefulness comes into question. And to elaborate a bit on this notion, I will allow myself to provide a few examples. And the first one is what you see here on the screen, which is um, our uh, 22nd uh, issue titled Publishing the Struggle, where we revisited some uh, canonical historical publications alongside some contemporary ones um, from around the world, many of which were strongly inspired by Fennel. One of the one of the particular publications that so these are some of the spreads from uh, from this issue, and one of this particular publication that I just want to want to delve a bit into was uh, uh, the legacies of the Black Panda newspaper. Um, so the the catalyst of this publication was the all too familiar case of Black Death at the hands of the police, uh, with a particular event of the death of a 22-year-old Denzel Dowell in 1968. Frustrated by the lack of information from the law enforcement, Dowell's family turned to the Panthers for assistance. And in response, they published a four-page newsla newsletter to mobilize community support. And the birth of this newspaper basically provided a medium for an alternative perspective about the organization the Black Panther organization as such, and about the crisis confronting Black America. And not only did the newspaper vocalize Black struggles locally, but encouraged Black Americans to imagine themselves as part of a global community of struggles, for instance, uh, uh, declaring solidarity with Palestine, with what was going on in Biafra, in Mexico, Vietnam, China. And basically learning from these historical lessons, publishing thus became sort of a social political intervention and a site of potential progression of, of liberation struggles. So it allowed the oppressed and the racialized bodies to understand their own political realities and enabled them to organize and struggle against those realities. The second example that I would like to bring forward is our latest book uh, from 2019 uh, titled The Funambulous by, by its Readers, Political Ge Ge Geographies from uh, Chicago and Elsewhere. 
When in 2019, we were commissioned by the Chicago Architecture Biennale to produce a book for, for the event, a number of questions arose. What does it mean to collaborate with an institution that is affiliated with an oil company? So the, the BP, who also happens to be the main sponsor of the event. In addition, what does it mean to contribute to an institution that was conceived under the former mayor of the city, Ram Emanuel? Just for a brief contextualization, during his eight years of tenure, his administration shut down 49 public schools, encouraged the gentrification of neighborhoods predominantly um, inhabited by black and brown working class, and reinforced a police force that practices what even the US Department of Justice itself call, has called a pattern of practice of a, a, a pattern of, and practice of unconstitutional abuses, especially targeting black and Latin um, individuals. So in this confrontation, we decided that the key notion emer emerging from this book should be the notion of political usefulness, if not operative for those fighting on the ground. So this is why we basically tested this notion by inviting 20 regular readers of the Finambles to pick amongst them one particular text uh, in the first 22 issues that appeared to them as being particularly politically useful and to explain it uh, to explain it um, for for the anthology that we that we gathered which was then republished in this uh, in this book and in addition and rather than ignoring the political reality of the context uh, that the Biennale was situated. So the first part was this uh, was this text that we revisited and the second part was basically uh, attempting to challenge the institutional framework of the of the Biennale and in these conditions our participation to the Biennale was conditioned on making this critique heard through voices of five Chicago-based activists to write about the spatial uh, politics of the city in relation to one being settler colonialism, one being the municipality, the police, the real estate pressure and the school system, as well as basically dedicating a third of our total production budget to their honoraria. My, the, the last thing I'd like to speak a bit about is what we define as the poli uh, politics of form. Um, so yeah, in this last part, I would like to call into question the vast range of political, ethical and social formations of, of production when, when running a publication. Um, so again, this will be addressed as the politics of form rather than the content as many political elements that usually remain undiscussed have become an inevitable uh, part of our everyday activities. And similarly, our editorial work requires to confirm a number of decisions that have, that have important political consequences, but, but rarely get addressed as part of a larger debate within the industry itself. Questions such as what choices have, have been made to generate revenue as one question, who form part of the decision making process and why, whose voices are being heard and how are the voices that do emerge given great, a greater or lesser leg uh, legitimacy or even readily visible in the constructions of global narratives, is the content accessible, what are the ne networks of distributions, what are the working conditions of those individuals, basically external part of the, of the, of the editorial formation itself, this saying the labor bodies outside of, um, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, out, the, uh, the ones, the ones uh, being part of the, of, uh, of, of printing operations or, or distribution logistics, is the content free? And if not, does the price change depending on the content or uh, on the context or the social st status of the readers? And I mean, this list of, of 
ongoing questions. However, I mean, these questions basically constitute an important part of our, ed of our editorial endeavors. And although our answers through practice-based examples cannot reach perfection, whether we're applying a price differentiation based on different geographical locations or attempting to develop more content in open access, for instance, as you see here on the screen, this was the la latest project that we basically launched, which is uh, titled the Phenomenalist Correspondence, where we once every week publish a new text in open access uh, or exclusively providing free access to, to a particular issue as we did with the Pan-African issue for, the, for everyone living on the African continent to make, to make the magazine useful in that in the particular continent when we dive into the Pan-African uh, imaginary. I mean, so basically these questions remain at the center of, of what constitutes the phenomenalist. Thank you so much for that, Margarita. That was an amazing introduction to all the work that you're doing. Um, I think, I mean, I want to, I want us to talk about more about these kind of practice, practice based endeavors, as you just put it, and, and to pick up also on the idea of political usefulness that you um, raised, because you've both, you've both talked or written about how Kind of critiques of colonial oppression are appropriated by publishing institutions um, and how kind of symbolic claims like you know claims to inclusive inclusiveness or diversity can kind of shore up the existing power of those institutions rather than redistributing it um, so can we talk a little bit about um, and maybe you have questions for each other about this because and um, you know of the different work that you're doing um, kind of about how how the res a bit more about how your respective publications kind of endeavor to break with that tendency so like so both are obviously very concerned with center centering marginalized voices the voices of those who are actively involved in struggle and then what you just highlighted margarita about um foregrounding the voices of readers as well um i think what would be interesting and what would be interesting to hear is a bit about how the material, how it's commissioned, how it's distributed in a standard issue of the publication can kind of tend towards that sort of political usefulness. Um, I don't just, that's a question for, for both of you really. Um, so I don't mind <laughs> who, who, who goes first. Um, well, in, in, in that sense, uh, well, in Terremoto, we've been working throughout soon to be 20 issues. Uh, each issue has 12 articles, uh, both uh, in English and Spanish, also as a way to make the, the text and ideas, reflections circulate uh, beyond uh, the, that, uh, that language, beyond the, the languages. We're st I wish we could do it also in Portuguese, but there's also the implications of, of translation and the cost of, of translation in all this equation. Mm. It's important to say that Terremoto is a non-for-profit, so as, as the same as the Phonambulist online is open access, and the print version is, is freely distributed uh, around the continent, mainly right now through uh, bookstores, um, would that consider the the arts uh, or theory or art history in in their in their catalogs museums uh independent spaces around the around the continent as well as some galleries or art first when they were art first of course uh, so oh and by the way i have one phonambulist only hey. one <laughs> <laughs> i wish they had more <laughs> and well this is the printed version of the remoto uh, we're planning to return to printing for the 20th issue. The 18th and the 19th only exist online because of the COVID uh, uh, circumstances. It, it, was, it wasn't a possibility to continue printing in terms of not only costs, but, all, but also in terms of distribution. So, of course, some things that, we, that we've been trying to rethink through this, through the actual uh, present in, in regards to difficulties to 
to transport the issues because we usually do it uh, hand to hand, for example, in which we give 10 copies to colleagues or friends that are visiting or that we concede that we were uh, in the same city for any reason. Uh, so the, the printed version uh, works as a way of breaking or let's say of escaping the limits that the digital uh, version has in terms of social media. For example, for us, it's very common that Facebook censor our content because of political themes that they that they uh, read as uh, yes, as in terms of of contaminating or 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 yeah, disrupting the democratic order of the politically correct uh, arena that are social media. So that that is something that we're continuously. Uh, trying to fight. For example, right now, Facebook does not does not allow us to promote our content that much. We have we have limited uh, possibility of, of of visibilization through that through that platform. And well, of course, it depends also on on our uh, how to say IPN IPN that is the 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 code of our in, of our internet in the in the in the huge infrastructure of the world. So of course, if we uh, promote or we post it, publish anything online, it limits itself to the region of Mexico, maybe Central America, according to our, to our statistics. And it's very hard to reach to other regions. When we reach to those regions is because of, of, of our readers that follow us uh, with compliment. And of course, the, 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 the printed version allows us to move beyond those limits uh, allow us to to maybe be in in uh, physically in archives for example we 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 have lucky to be in archives of some universities in the US of some universities in in Chile in Argentina uh, that also allows a possibility of 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 encountering the, the text from other perspectives and from other way of of of, of approaching the themes uh, right now what are we trying to to rethink in terms of distribution is of course we limited we reduce our copies or we're going to reduce our copies for the 20th issue uh, because of costs, of course. Uh, of mm. course. Mm. Uh, right now in Mexico, uh, the, the cultural sector is, is a struggling. The government has uh, actioned since last year uh, a law that is uh, an austerity law in which in that populist uh, logic of this government, they, tend, they, they have tend to uh, create a narrative around the arts as something that is from the privileged class mm -hmm. that even though it is in, in its in, in its in its history and in in, all, in several ways uh, that reduction that is essential essentialism uh, it's continuously uh, erosioning the possibilities of 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 finding funding of of, of accessing to grants or 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 any fiscal any fiscal uh, possibilities that allow that in the past were allowed. So in, in, in those terms, by reducing the, the amount of copies, we are we are trying to understand another way of reaching out to our network uh, through that physicality. In that in that sense, I believe a lot in the power of the printing of the printed word. Uh, there, there's a there's a, a reason that we're still that we're still trying to pursue to do it. Uh, that is mainly because of 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 the possibilities of of conservation and of keeping information uh, beyond the radar of censorship. And in that way, what we're trying to do with with any type of of distribution is we're, we're reducing the the distribution points around the continent, and we're tr we're uh, we're motivating this, the, our allies or our, our friends and colleagues that when, when they receive a box of 25 and I don't know copies, uh, they make, uh, they, they try to, to follow other ways of distribution, whether it's hand by hand, whether it's by leaving copies uh, some, somewhere random uh, in, in the places, uh, by, by getting copies to people that they know that they may be interested. Uh, or making a, a small event of giveaway with, of course, all the all the precautions due to the pandemic, in which just giving the copies uh, freely to anyone that is interested. Uh, 
it's a continuous it's a continuous uh, um, challenge that one of of understanding other ways of circulation. Mm-hmm. Of course, there is the there is a challenge of escaping the the echo chamber that the arts sometimes becomes, uh, or the endogamic uh, relations that we te- that we tend to perpetuate. Uh, but it's it's also the way in which trying to look other distribution points, uh, mainly through independent spaces, for example. Uh, that's a way that has been w- working for us a lot, in which colleagues or friends that have a small independent spaces, mainly non in capital cities around the continent, allow us to ship a box and they just give away the copies to another different to a totally different uh, public that those be that those that are frequent to museums or book or specialized bookstores for example mm. that's so uh, there are so many things i want to pick up on there but that's such an interesting kind of counter narrative about the, the 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 power of printed material to the kind of dominant idea of digital publishing and how it kind of opens everything up and it's liberating and it, and it connects people. I think that's it's really interesting what you just said. Um, and Margarita, I noticed, I mean, I could see that that was, the, there was something resonating with you there. Um, so I wonder if, could, could you speak to that at all and your experience of kind of the various um, freedoms and or challenges that have come with, with, distributing some distributing a physical magazine and all of the kind of logistical considerations that in, are involved in that and then maybe both of you also as well like the um this this idea of the kind of the tension between pursuing these decolonial alternative publishing practices and 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 also the need to survive not only as a publication but as a publication within a kind of challenged art world it would be interesting to hear both of your thoughts on that as well anyway margarita i'll let you go first yeah i mean one of the one of the major challenges that we that we face within the finambulist is basically to reach a broader readers readership mm-hmm. most of the grounds that we cover or most of the topics that we cover are related to to different political struggles, especially in the global south. The vast majority of our readership is based in the global north. And I mean, one issue of the publication, if you, if you, buy, if you just buy a single copy, it's uh, 20 euros, <laughs> which is a significant amount. Uh, I mean, depending on depending on where where you're located, of course, and and for us, I think we we continuously strive to basically try to bridge this financial gen, uh, financial gap that we see, um, and this and and I mean, this is also this is also why we are continuously trying to 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 find different ways of developing more content in open access uh, somehow. The project that the last project that I presented, uh, the Finambas correspondence, is only made possible through a very generous grant from from the Graham Foundation, for instance, because we don't we ourselves doesn't have the the, the financial infrastructure to carry to carry out um, carry out this project. But but I mean, if, I think. Somehow, even though I myself personally enjoy enjoy the physicality of the publication, I also I also do see the need to extend on the sort of more digital um, the digital format uh, format uh, expand it um, and in that in that way to to yeah <coughs> reach. All, uh, a broader audience and also to become useful in 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 different contexts um, around the world. Um, there, there was one thing that I that I specifically had in mind, and I think it it related to something that you said. I, I think uh, perhaps five minutes ago, but but perhaps it uh, it comes up. Um, 
So I think, yeah, for, for now, I just, I'll just uh, leave it there. I mean, also, also again, as, as, I was, as I was saying, that, that we have two open access uh, platforms, so basically, so the blog, and then, and then the podcast, which, also, which is also a way to, um, to make a co content much more accessible um, uh, globally in that sense. Is it curious because we, we also our our readership is mainly from the global north yeah that like the well, the first the first country that we are read according to Google Analytics of course it's kind of reductant uh, yeah. is Mexico and the US then is Brazil uh, Chile Colombia and then it's Spain France and Germany so it's still it's still mainly a readership from 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 the global north. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're on there there's also in this in this uh in the chosen of in the in the in the decision of of the editorial lines there is uh, an, uh, an, an a conscious that the main readership it's it's a north uh, a north reader uh i know that we're mainly speaking to a to a to a system and an, a contemporary art system that is Western centric still. Mm -hmm. So there, there, is, there is some way in which sometimes, for example, criticism that comes uh, to us is that sometimes we're very repetitive in the themes. Sometimes we are uh, very, uh, yeah, we're mainly very repetitive. That's, that's one of the, of the main ones. Like, oh, you're always talking about decolonization. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Like okay, uh, yes, we're always talking about this because this is a still an issue. There is a still there is a fundamental uh, aspect in which how we think artistic practices and curatorial researches there is a still action through a logic of an anthropological logic, an archaeological, and it, it's mainly a still a one that positions human and democracies as the center of a progressive uh, political. Uh, development in, in terms of discourse and, and criticality. Uh, it's, it's a still a system that denies the access uh, to the system to racialize bodies. It's a still a system that, that hierarchizes uh, practices between, uh, in, in, in specifically in Mexico, between upper, and upper art and low art. Being low art, usually those traditional uh, practices uh, so we're still in there. We're still in there, and, and as, as, as Margarita said, uh, pointing out uh, regarding the readership that they that they uh, aided with. It was with the Chicago Architectural Biennial, right? Yeah, but like as, as, as Margarita pointed out, the art system is very close to extractive and exploitative industries. Yeah. It, almost all the all the money that finances uh, uh, the, the arts. It's it's a it's a it's a money marked by by blood and exploitation. Mm. So they're they're on. Uh, we I mean I we know in Terremoto that when we're editing these these uh, these texts these discourses we're inhabiting a position of contradiction, mm -hmm. and that is that 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 is a, a point in which uh, the art world is continuously uh, trying to move away from from contradictions. This is still a moral, uh, a, a, a moral uh, field in which he's trying to make the correct. Just see what had just happened with Santiago Sierra's piece <laughs> around indigenous, indigenous blood. Yeah, like it, it's still a, a it's still a, a white centered uh, system. It's a, it's a system uh, with a colonial capitalist in, uh, in conscious in, in, in words of Sully Rolnik, mm -hmm. in which is actioning mainly through guilt. And is trying to 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 expel the, uh, our own guilds as complaints as, as compliances of the of a, an exploitative system. Yeah. So uh, it, I, I believe that what the Fenambulis do and what Terremoto does or other publications such as Artist Shock uh, in Chile, for example, uh, or other small magazines around the country that are starting to to come up, uh, are a way of of starting to to put in action politics of of, of of restoration, of, of repairment. In that sense, uh, surviving 
as, as, as a mag as a non-profit magazine that not only translates but also keeps up keeps up a, a website a pace to the to the contributors we still doesn't we still do not pay as much as I would like to mm -hmm. because that, that's that's also a challenge but we also limit it in, in other in, 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 in several ways around I, I will say that for example, in terms of Mexico, it's very recent that uh, funding grants or, or, or programs consider magazines or editorial uh, non-books or non-academic or non research based uh, editorial context as part of the, of the, possi of the possibilities to, to support. That's something very recent that changed maybe two or three years ago, when mm -hmm. right now has seven, seven years uh, going around. Uh, so, I will say that that is it still is it still something that we have to consider of mm -hmm. of, of, of that of, of that of circulation. I do also believe that that online and, and podcasts is, is something great, and we're trying to make it happen this year if if, if possible, uh, <laughs> because also the power of the, of listening that's 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 also something as a, a strategy or not not only a strategy but a position of of doubting our 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 privilege uh, positions in the world where whiteness does not allow us to listen yeah. so also a podcast has a, has a sense of power in that in in, the, in in those terms because you have to you have to put attention you have to be immersed in yeah. someone's voice there's so there's some time of erotization in that process that also makes the text to inhabit our bodies different in a different way oh i like that a lot yeah that's great um I want to come but back to the. Oh, sorry, Margarita. Just, uh, yeah, just if I can, if you can add something to that. I mean, Please. I mean, this is this is really the question, right, uh, Diego? I think I think you're pointing at some very very crucial things, and and when we speak of publishing, the publishing industry or curatorial practice um, as such, or or the, or the way of kind of categorizing the way we preserve or the way culture is preserved, the way culture or knowledge is produced and disseminated, uh, which has basically historically been defined by by a sort of uh, Western worldview, uh, right? I mean, publishing, just going back to publishing that has been put at the center of a sort of colonial po uh, project, we, like we're learning through the, uh, the, uh, the 20th century, that that these colonial uh, that these colonial impul impulses or these colonial uh, colonial powers imperial powers basically used censorships and applied a, a, a monopolies to to basically ap a, apply even more violence uh, towards or uh, towards racialized bodies or or colon colonialized bod bodies and. So to, to this end, when when this act of cultural production or or knowledge formation has been has 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 taken this shape of territory of domination, that basically tends to advance certain kind of ideals that are uh, uh, defined by the West. Again, how 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 do we dismantle this? And if we yet today are still con confronted with this sort of a uh, very coward, cowardly tendency of confronting these realities, um, uh, I mean, I think I think you're pointing to very, very uh, some very, very um, uh, crucial, crucial things there. If I can, if I just allow to just give a, one concrete example, uh, a year ago when I was visit, uh, when I was visiting Tanzania, I had this, um, I had this, these very great conversations with um, with Walter Mgoya is his name. He is the founder of uh, Mukuki Nanyota, which is an independent publishing house in Dar es Salaam. He. At the beginning of his career, he inherited the Tanzanian publishing house, which was the publishing, the main publishing institution that was created by the British, uh, the British uh, colonial rule in Tanzania. And then he, and then he found his way out <laughs> of this uh, of this very violent institution, and then established uh, Mukuki Nanyota instead, which is basically very much about centering black subjectivity. Um, and this is and this is a s sort of ongoing process. I mean, it's 
very, very specific example is going away from the language of the colon uh, colonizer, insisting on reaching the audience in Swahili, uh, for instance, uh, and applying different modes of disseminating this knowledge that they're producing in this particular publishing house. This, I mean, uh, there is this strong sense of organizing and advocacy as a, like a community, community organizing as a way to disseminate knowledge uh, instead of a sort of traditional way or the ways that we perceive as traditional to reach audiences. Uh, so, so how could, I mean, how could, how could one learn from these sort of examples um, somehow to, dis to dismantle these structures that are somehow upheld up, up by these, uh, by these um, Western, Western uh, societies. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think, I think these questions are extremely, extremely complex and complicated um, and do not myself have the right answers to them, but, but, I, but I know that there are so many great examples out there and both historical lessons and, and, and also more contemporary examples that we could potentially gaze at, um, yeah. Thank you, yeah, thank you. I mean, to, fo to follow up on that, thinking about the, those, those historical and contemporary examples and, and also the fact that you've, you've both kind of highlighted in different ways the art system as a kind of central institution of the, of the sort of modern colonial world. Um, and how you know art publishing is part of that institutional apparatus. I wonder if you think that there is conversely a kind of connection between, or, or sort of a sense in which alliances with artists and art worker kind of communities could could hold a particular potential to move things in the opposite direction. So like. You know, is there a, is there any particular potential within the art system to challenge colonial logics as well as to reproduce them? And is that I, I don't know is that a question of I'm not I, I don't think I mean in terms of of aesthetics, but maybe um, in 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 a more kind of like um, well maybe I do I don't know I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this one over to you um, uh, maybe. Also, I mean, I want, we're running out of time and we do have to take questions from the audience. I can't hog all the questions, but um, the, I think, Diego, you also briefly mentioned Mexico City and that, that being a specific context in which kind of um, the, the art system um, and the sort of cluster of cultural institutions sort of sustains this kind of colonial centralism. So since we've got five minutes maybe to, to to end on I kind of wanted to go deeper into the critique but maybe we could let's talk about you know where you think the potential is um, how you think the art that that the art world and art workers can be implicated in in decolonial change and, and maybe how you both envisage or how you would envisage a, a sort of decolonial publishing or decolonial art publishing Mm -hmm. Well, I mean the context. The context in Mexico in re regarding the arts, for example, it's it's totally related into the creation of mestizaje or mestizo as a as a cultural policy of eugenistic homogenization of the of the of the population in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, as I point out in the text that will be published uh, following uh, Arturo Abreu. Uh, there, there is this way in which modernism, in, in, in the terms of aesthetics, uh, transforms the bodies of the, the racialized bodies in the context of Mexico, the indigenous and Afro-diasporic bodies, into raw material that they, in that, from which they get inspiration to form the, the imaginary that in the 1920s, post-revolutionary, and until now, which is a, it's, it's a discourse that is is, all, is again emerged through this through this new government. Uh, they transform these bodies into real material that create the, the nation-state imaginary. 
-hmm. of course, a nation state pointing, pointing more towards whiteness than towards uh, um, another understanding of, of, of nations that inhabit these territories. Uh, they're on a way of engaging into, into that, into the a process of decolonization as art workers or, or, or art agents or cultural workers more than art. Yeah. Uh, is, is understanding also, also time non-linearly mm. uh, as, as a lot of cultures uh, in the global south understand. So, and, and, and here I'm following specifically Denise, Denise Ferreira da Silva, when she, when she understands the entangled world, also in terms of time and space, uh, time being a colonial invention, then what we suppose is a past is not a past, it's a present future that defines all the possibilities of life. They're on if we know that the cultural and art system contributed to the formation of the violence and power that is still killing and actioning a necropolitics in this territory, we have to take a stance on, uh, towards it. Mm -hmm. And taking a stance beyond the performative politics of social media or image, taking a stance uh, is, 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 is also a way of imagining publishing beyond the paper and the, and the letters, mm -hmm. is spoken word, is uh, taking the floor, uh, is allowing uh, uh, voices that are not usually contemplated in the codes of, of rational uh, arts or theorization or historization to be part of, of, of the process is to move beyond that, that intelligibility uh, system, maybe make graffitis, make me make stencils, make me make, maybe uh, just think collectively in the terms of, pack, of, of packs. Uh, it, it, as, as we can see, the, the professionalization of the arts, uh, since its its context is neoliberal is neoliberalism, in Mexico, I, 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 it's, I can see it. It moved forward an individual logic. So, to for to the for the artists, the curators, or almost all the people that are, that we are part of the art system, it's very difficult to imagine collective ways of actioning. Mm -hmm. Because neoliberaliz neoliberalization through the profanization of the arts installed the idea of 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 of, the, of making of authorship, and in, in, in that idea of authorship relies all, all, all the violence that don't, that doesn't allow us to recognize ourselves as 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 others. Let's 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 say although the the language is limited to the idea that I'm trying to portray. Uh, in that sense, uh, I don't know, reading out loud, sharing, allowing ourselves to, to discuss a text. I'm constantly, right, right now, for example, in my therapy, I, I'm constantly repeating how lonely it feels, the political searching that I'm doing. Uh, not only because of, of, of the present that we are in, and, and iso social isolation, uh, the, the digitalization of life that makes uh, the things more harder and, and, and then the weight of, 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 of all that language. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's difficult for us to action in WhatsApp groups or in Zoom. There is, there is a part that is missing. And, and we have to disobey in, in, in with certain responsibility uh, that that new biopolitics of the fear of the of the body that is not mine, mm. uh, and in that way, uh, well, the arts. I, I have always understand the art, the artwork or the art object as an extension of the body, uh, even though it, there is a certain autonomy of it when it's presented in the in the in exhibition space. Is it still an extension of the artist's body? And that artist's body is not possible individually. It's possible because it is related to others. And, and that is a Buntu, uh, a Buntu philosophy uh, aspect. So I am because I am the others. I am because we are together. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, it, it's, it's also, it, it, we have to question those epistemologies that form our, our own sense of what we understand as art agents, cultural workers, mm -hmm. artists, curators, editors, writers. Uh, and we have to allow to, 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 those, to those things to make, to move towards an ethics of, 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 of moving the world.
thank you. That is very, a lot of very inspiring thoughts there. Um, Margarita, do you want to speak to that as well at all? And then I'll open up to questions from the audience. Uh, no, I don't. I don't have a specific, uh, specific point to this. I think uh, I think what you just pointed out is yeah, very much uh, spot on. Thank you for that. Okay, great. Well, in that case, we have some we have some great questions already in the Q and A. Um, please, anyone, feel free to ask more if you have them. So the first one is from um, Dana Abdullah, uh, who says, "Is it possible to create a community via publishing like it was in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, um, or what form does community take now via publishing practices, where most publications are based largely around lifestyle?" Um, I guess sort of superficially meant. Um, would anyone like to offer thoughts on that? I suppose the ways in which we form uh, it, this, what, what you were saying just now, Diego, about about the use of, of online platforms, I'm using WhatsApp, using Zoom. I think there is, there is often a tendency to kind of um, assume community from these forms of connectedness where there isn't necessarily a substantial, a sense of community that the, as, as perhaps some of these ex radical examples from the past might have or, uh, or we imagine they might have had um, when you when you um, when you talk about building a community for your publications what it could you I, I guess I hope this answers the, this this gets at the question could you talk a little bit more about what what, what it is that that means to you um, and how it might be um, where how the possibilities for community might be limited now in ways that perhaps they weren't they 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 haven't been historically does that make sense to either of you well in that sense maybe margarita can tell us tell us a little bit more of of that black panthers mm. issue because i think there is a lot of consonance regarding this question yeah definitely definitely but basically, basically, again, as 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 I was saying, that that this uh, the news newspaper uh, sort of, um, I mean, conceived to vocalize the black struggle, and then encourage basically black Americans to 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 be a part of this community and 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 also imagine themselves as a part of a of a larger community of a global community in front of struggles uh, across the world as I mentioned uh, Palestine Biafra yeah. and and so forth um, if I hmm, I think perhaps. I think perhaps I I want to give you give you another practice based example on the, on Dana's uh, question to to this um, the 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 topic of community is is something that is very very present uh, for everything that we do at the Finambulist when when we when we basically say that we that we are attempting to build to build uh, or to mobilize uh, this international um, or create a platform that allows different people from different geographical scale to build solidarity across uh, yeah uh, to build solidarity that's 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 one way that's one way of the, of, of how this community could basically be conceived through uh, through what we through what we're attempting to do with the with our publishing activities, another very specific uh, specific example that I would like to speak a bit about is um, it's not it's not that official yet, but uh, but it will uh, ho hopefully within the, within the next couple of weeks. We decided 
um, some time ago to, to establish a network, uh, the Funambulist Network, as we call it. It will be a part of a new website that we are currently developing. But basically this network would be this sort of database gathering all information about all our contributors. So uh, where, whereas, whereas uh, both their sort of expertises, their locations and all, all sort of very, very uh, important informations are listed and where, where one could also be able to, to, uh, to contact one another. And, and, and the idea of this is basically to give something back to, to our contributors. Um, and, but, 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 but again, also try to push, uh, to push uh, the, sort of, uh, the sort of our activities beyond our own, uh, our own airwaves. No, uh, to try to foster international dialogues. We've seen we've seen that uh, uh, happening amongst amongst uh, the graduate architects, which we started featured, which we feature, featured uh, with a very very short project um, in um, in the second half of uh, twenty twenty, where where we where we kind of now see these uh, these amazing amazing emerging architects coming together discussing, um, learning from one another. Uh, and, and, and for me, it's, it's amazing to see this happen um, because me, me, I, I guess many, many, of this, many of these people and, and also, also on, on, uh, from, uh, from my, my particular uh, position, uh, I mean, being, being trained within a certain kind of institution that has a very, very problem problematic way of seeing the world. I think it, it, has, it has been sort of, especially, yeah, again, for me, it has been very, very interesting and very important to, tr to try to find, uh, to try to, <laughs> to, to find some allies, you know, to, um, um, to <laughs> to unlearn or <laughs> to uh, yeah to to have the space to uh, to vocalize uh, our dis despairs and 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 so forth and yeah so so I guess the last meeting that that we attended uh, Leopold and, and myself was less than a month ago where we tried to where we tried to put these uh, these emerging architects uh, together. And and if this is the first step of trying to trying to foster or trying to nurture uh, a space uh, for uh, for some community building between these uh, between these practitioners, then I mean that would be that would be that would be great for us if um, yeah if if the project reaches that far but but yeah one specific project is the Finambles uh, network uh, which we are very very excited to launch very soon and which we really hope uh, uh, will extend beyond the publication itself and just live sort of its own life um, in that sense, I think it's also very important, following what Margarita says, like, well, Dana's uh, question is, is referencing the 1960s and the 1970s. And well, there, there was a conscious, uh, for example, in the Black uh, Panthers movement or the Pan-Africanism movement, in which they knew that they have learned the colonial language or the colonial logic. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of, of pedagogic and educational efforts to unlearn, as, as Margarita points out, that logic. So what, what we print, what we publish, uh, and it has to, it has to move, or move to, all, to spaces of collective discussion, of collective reading, of reflection, of almost therapeutic <laughs> understandings of the text, not only uh, reading them or approaching them through a, a, a rational logic, but also uh, through uh, an emotional one. Like how, what, how does these words, how does these ideas uh, affect my body, affect mm -hmm. our bodies? How, 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 how am I re-encountering myself when, when uh, for example, in, in my experience, how do I re-encounter myself when I get pointed out the whiteness that I incarnate or the heterosexuality that I incarnate, inevitably that I'm a fag or 
like how how do I how I'm I'm practicing that in a daily basis, who I'm related to, who I listen, who I'm friends with, like like the the, the idea of of of, of of artistic practice beyond the object is the conscious of the habit that creates the world in a daily basis so mm -hmm. like there there is there is a thing in, in resonating there so action in those spaces of pedagogy of collective studying it's a way to to add to to be a militant of these ideas and and well that and that question also comes or, or also interpolates the organization of this event like, yeah. how, how are we going to do continuity to this that we're doing? Mm -hmm. When I'm going to see again Margarita, Margarita or when are we going there again to have a conversation? Mm -hmm. Like th th those things like challenge our notions of, of, of work, of, the, of, of, of time in a project. Uh, like, and, and, and I'm thinking also in these conferences, I don't know, the Third World Conference or, uh, or these alliances, the global alliances in, in, in in those same ages that Dana point out, and that they had an agenda. They got together once or twice a year uh, because they were pushing uh, agendas to, towards a hegemony. I'm thinking specifically in the Third World Alliance, for example. And in, in they, they came together, discussed ideas that were affecting them, and then they were trying to push policies. What does it mean to do that in the art world? And yeah, in, in, in Europe, there, there's a conversation that's starting through the, the the exfoliated objects being returned to to African countries and nations, but there's a still very narrowed into that context, and and anti-racist movements also are starting to to articulate those ideas, mainly of immigrants in Europe. So mm -hmm. you you can see that there 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 is a community base a community base uh, uh, link to publishing. We just have to put more attention to it and may, and maybe come closer to those to those initiatives that are already happening mm. and and perhaps yeah harness that idea of there being there being a shared struggle there is a you know there's a thing that we're that that these communities are working towards together um we have these are very kind of broad topics we've been talking about i've noticed there are quite a few sort of practical questions so maybe we could do a slight we don't have very much time maybe we could do a slight quick fire examples kind of thing so the next um we had anonymous question um someone asked if you have examples on ways to find funding without relying on kind of capitalist or colonialist structures um what would yeah, it's a big what would be some <laughs> yeah anti anti-capitalist anti-colonial ways to finance a publication and then there was another one also about um uh much further down about now that because you are both magazines very much dependent on funding are there any implications of that in terms of censorship from your financial contributors um if you are um if you're if you're able to talk about that um yeah maybe maybe one quick example from each of you <laughs> if you have them or, or or just kind of like one one quick thought on 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 funding what kinds of funding that that de publications interested in decolonization should be should be seeking out um, what maybe like what one or two of the challenges of these um, of that kind of model are for your publications it's a hard one I, know. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I don't know in our case in terremoto ish um, for example we we had an we have an auction last a couple of weeks to funding that's not wow. anti capitalist at, at, at all <laughs> but it's also the 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 things that we have to do because i mean we if we didn't do that auction terremoto will not have funding now yeah like, Hey, we didn't have how to pay our staff. We are an eight-member staff. We're still a, a small in some sorts of another. Uh, but I will say that we need more international uh, funding programs. I will say in, in that sense that come from the north to the south, specifically. Uh, not only like as a way of also reparation <laughs> of, of all the damage mm -hmm. that the north has done, uh, or or the or the 
of the world the west specifically has done yeah. uh, for example the only one that that we can we can apply to is uh prince claus which we already had last year thank you prince claus uh, <laughs> but then there's nothing else then we mm. only rely on the private sector whether it's collectors we have a program of of, of in which we we do a, a an edition of, a, of an, invi an invited artist, we pay that that uh, that addition to the artist. Fifty percent of the of the of the uh, the income com goes to to them. The other fifty percent comes to us. Uh, I will say that more collaborative ways of thinking that it's hard because we have to pay staff, printing, writers, uh, the website, uh, translation, like. It's it's kind of hard to think in anti-colonial or anti-capitalist ways of funding in an in a colonial and capitalist world. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, of it, course. it's kind of hard. Yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm still trying to imagine that. Yeah, yeah. Margarita, um, what what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, that's a. I mean, that's a that's a very very good question. I mean, as for us, I. The magazine depends on its sales, so yeah. so the question of funding and the question of uh, of of external financial contribution contributions is quite limited in the, when when we speak of the financialists. Of course, I mentioned the Graham Foundation because they have been they have been the ones providing us some crucial grants. Uh, the past years and 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 in particular now with this uh, the financialist correspondent project where we basically used the the total amount of the budget or the fu uh, uh, the funding that we received to to um to pay the the contributors but but otherwise otherwise the the financialist as such uh, it really depends on uh, on sales uh, almost ex ex exclusively um so 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 i don't so yeah perhaps perhaps my answer here is not really no and i think a lot of magazines have to even if they are not for profit you know there that's, is that, that's a position of contradiction but i will yeah. i would like to add something for example in the in in the last three years we have noticed because terremoto we also print uh, because uh, pub uh, publishing advertising i'm sorry um it's a part of our income and we have noticed that, that, that from the last two years to now, three years to now, museums do not contemplate a budget for advertising. Even though they are the institution of accumulation yeah. of value in the arts, they do not redistribute that value to publications that are not part of their structure. Mm -hmm. And there is something to consider. That mm -hmm. less and less museums, year after year, answer us i'm sorry i don't have budget for advertising so it's like oh so what do you want me to do <laughs> this is an ecosystem so I, I think we have also to point out the notion of of, of we're an we're an ecosystem in terms of institutions uh, galleries etc etc mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay i'm going to try and get in a few more questions um one was um Okay, we'll have one more on we'll have one more on financial questions, which is when starting a publication and there's no sufficient budget to um, always pay for contributors. Is it still do you do you think it's still correct to commission? Um, so without falling into the trap of offering visibility that could be exploitative, um, but still develop work um, that doesn't depend on you necessarily having the the finances to do it. Are, are these, I mean, I'm not sure if these are dilemmas you've had to consider. This is quite hypothetical. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just uh, answer quite uh, very, very briefly on, on this one. I think mm. it's a matter of value, the work that uh, um, that people carry out for us. So, so valuing it by, by offering a honorarium. Mm. Um, I mean, this is this this is nothing that we uh, sort of. Um, this is not not something that's up even up for discussion uh, in 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 what we do. I think this is just 
has to has to be very clear that that this yeah that this is how we do things uh, without compromising although as you also were pointing at diego i mean we would love to to be paying more uh, to to a com uh, contributors but um, but 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 uh, for for the time being we are we, <laughs> we are doing what we can but uh, but visibility is simply not uh, is simply not <laughs> good enough I think uh, it's um, no yeah, yeah no, I I will second this like, <laughs> because visibility is the, is a trap of neoliberalism yeah but give me yeah. give me your work in the exchange of visibility <laughs> for you being marginalized systemically all the, all this time but don't worry I'll give you visibility like mm -hmm. no. Mm. Sorry, but no, it's, it's it's it doesn't work like that anymore. Thanks uh, for your decisive answers. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, what was I going to ask you next? Um, we had another anonymous question. Uh, Diego said in his introduction, Terramoto, that you distribute editorial power. Could you just expand a bit on how that is done? Well, in that sense, when, when we have the budget, <laughs> I usually invite an, a guest editor to, to articulate the, the, the whole issue. They usually are women or feminized bodies. Uh, we've done an issue with Pilam Tomkis Rivas from, from LA. We've done with Fernanda Brenner from Pivo in Brazil, with Lorena, with Lorena Tavares in Colombia, with Maria Elena Ortiz in Miami. Uh, like, I, I, I tried to do that as uh, with Joe Jinping, uh, the, the, our recent issue, which was a South-South dialogue with the Southeast Asia. Um, so that, that's something that, uh, when I say distribute the editorial power, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, what is, and what is the main argument for, for doing that? I, I, I think it's great. I really do think it's great, but what is the... the main, well, it's... But it's two. I will say that one is strategically in the sense that I don't know the whole, uh, um, yeah, like the whole uh, heterogeneity of 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 the region and the specificities of, of of it. And the second is a way of also distributing the the my own power of of the editor, that is a cis gay man that benefits from whiteness and heterosexuality. So. That way, how can I also move away from that from that uh, uh, notion of myself and bring and bring a colleague, a friend, to think together issues that we're proposing? Uh, usually, the, the, the editorial process is a, a call with with them, or if they're in the city where we, we collaborate, we t we have conversations, we exchange references, texts. Uh, we're open to debates. Uh, we talk with a lot of people in in the region like very close uh, people that, that, that I, I respect their work, their experience, not only in the arts, but in the communities. Uh, so yeah, like distributing the power is like also doubting of, of, the, of the certainties that I assume from my own position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Bruno Freitas de Oliveira asks, um, if you consider tr transporting the topics and issues covered in the magazine into material that could be used by primary and secondary art teachers. So I guess, yeah, well, I, I guess it would also be interesting to hear how much you know about the sort of educational function that the magazines already play um, and who your audiences are. Um. Well, that would be great. <laughs> But we have also education systems that make that very difficult in that sense, at least in Mexico, for example. Uh, but we have a possibility that is the educational or art pedagogists uh, in our cultural sector. And that is also a, a something, and, and they use these texts, and I, I know that they use them in, at least people that I know in, in the classrooms they open, uh, whether there are the small courses or in, in, in universities or, I mean, in primarily as secondary art, uh, art teachers, it's something that it also in the case of Mexico, well, teachers in, in public universities where art is, is an option, they are more arrogated into traditional, into plastic uh, uh, 
forms of understanding art practices and and so so it, it, it's we're also confronting a generational break in that sense in the context of mexico in which there is a lot of 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 doubtings and ideas around contemporary art they yeah. classified it as something uh, yeah, like uh like something fake or something uh that it's it's not what they're, they're very conservators in that sense mm -hmm. so it's it's a hard one but i i know that uh, that at least friends and colleagues that are integrating into those art education spaces well they use some of the texts that we publish and others that are publishing other in other magazines or publications mm. and and i think on our end is uh, is mostly concerned architecture schools uh, architecture education around the world uh, or in the us and in, in, in europe sorry um i mean uh, Leopold, he had uh, he had a uh, six month uh, visiting um, uh, uh, tutor where 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 he served as a tutor in um, in the US uh, just two, two two years ago and then and then continuously attempting to engage um, architecture students um, into these conversations because I mean somehow <laughs> and and myself being trained as an architect um whereas a profession whereas the uh, the political the political dimension has been removed so, somehow historically mm. then, but 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 architecture basically serves a political power right it's it's it, it it's embodiment of of uh, of 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 a certain uh, uh, ideological positioning so 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 how so how to basically um, so how to basically propose an anti-normative reading of the built environment politic uh, of or, of the built environment or or propose an alternative that that basically challenges existing architectural curricula um, uh, yeah, so 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 trying to engage in conversations within architecture within architecture schools in in Europe and in the US. Um. Right. Um, uh, we have one minute, but I'm just going to throw one more question in there before um, we I, we end, wrap things up, um, which is that Margarita, you mentioned community orga organizing as a way of just. Oh, I'm getting a bit of. Um, feedback from somewhere. Anyway, um, you mentioned community organizing as a way to disseminate knowledge. Um, can you or Diego share or elaborate on a case study or example that resonated most with that? Um, and where did community organizing and knowledge dissemination meet there in the example? Does that make sense? I, I know you've already given a couple actually, um, and you spoke about community organizing a bit at the beginning of the Q&A, but just if there was anything any particular project that we could end on? Um, I do have, a, I have a couple. Great. Uh, I mean, when I, when, when I understand when uh, Margarita said community organizing as a way to disseminate low knowledge, mm. I understand that as knowledge that comes from, uh, from experiences that are confronting certain uh, problematics or, or, or hegemonies. Uh, and from those confrontation, from that confrontation, well, they complement the knowledge and disseminate it as tools to understanding uh, what they have in common with other with others in, in the world or in the specific world, or the specificities of the world they inhabit. For example, there is Colectivo IU in Madrid that is a collective of, um, of immigrants in, in Spain. And well, they are part of the anti-racist and anti-colonial movement. And before being an art collective, it is a community-based collective that, it, it, that it, it opposes the racist logics of, this, of the Spanish uh, government. Another example will be the collective of Rio Paraná, in, in the South Argentina, uh, uh, that is of Duensachi and Magda Santo, uh, in which they also are um, 
uh, reuniting or, or, or conjugating together uh, voices of indigenous uh, cultural agents, let's call it, that are part of bigger movements that go beyond the art world. Uh, they have a, a, um, a podcast in Spotify. It's only Spanish, but it's something that, that, that you should listen. Uh, there is also, for example, Maya Huracan and Diego Ventura in Guatemala, which they are part of the art world, but their, their, their compass in relation to the art world is mainly the, com the community indigenous-based art practices. Uh, not, they, are not, they do not center the logics uh, into understanding uh, collection or art practice or curatorial uh, speaking. And well, I, I think those, those are, are some of, of, what, of what you can find. Sorry, uh, thank you. I, um, I am aware that I need to um, wrap it up at this point. So I should say thank you to both of you so much for joining us and for having this conversation. I wish we could continue it for longer and I hope that we will um, in some way. Um, thank you everyone who joined us. Thank you to our amazing translators, um, to Maspe, Goldsmiths, uh, UAL, thanks. Um, everyone, if you, I mean, if the two of you want to stay on the line for a minute, um, I will just let everyone um, slowly disappear. <laughs> Thank you.